Happy Sabbath. I'm going to be reading from 1 Peter 3, 4. And it says, Rather let it be hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of the gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Let a word, the, the Lord add a blessing to the hearing of his word. Y'all may be seated. One of the things I get uh, pretty excited about is seeing the one of the things I get pretty excited about is seeing the teens uh, memorizing scripture. We're doing Pathfinder Bible Experience, and it's just it's pretty impressive to see teens that have huge swaths of, uh, uh, or even not even teens yet, preteens uh, memorizing huge swaths of scriptures. One, two, three chapters. We're, I think, trying to get them to read, memorize four or some even five chapters of the Bible. And they're doing such a good job. It's really impressive. Um, I've been <clears throat> looking through the same chapters that they've been studying a fair bit through the book of First Kings. First Kings is, for the most part, a pretty sad book. <laughs> There's a lot of brokenness in the book of First Kings. But it matches closely, I believe, the times that we live in. With that, I'm going to kneel down and ask the Lord to bless, bless the speaking of his word. Lord Jesus, we're going to talk about some tough scriptures. Um, and I just pray that each of us hears your voice individually. I pray that you communicate to us um, what you would have us to hear. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been um, going through a very lengthy series on the topic of evangelism and discipleship. Um, and the last few weeks, I've been discussing the topic of what to do, how to continue discipling people who have recently joined the faith. So praise the Lord today, we have people who have recently joined the faith. And uh, what an exciting moment it is. And, and I've been going through a series for many weeks about how, how you disciple people who have recently joined the faith. And... Um, one aspect of, of that, not all the aspects, we talked about, you know, nurturing them, building relationships, helping them uh, focus on studying God's word, etc., etc. But one aspect of that process of discipleship is working with them through the process of, of Christian standards. Um, this is a difficult sermon uh, because uh, we have to address very real problems that are happening within our own congregation. <clears throat> and um, I want to first just if, look at what was going on uh, during many, many years in the book of 1 Kings, and we'll talk about how that relates to us here and now. You know, um, I'm going to look at a bunch of different chapters, to 1 Kings 14, 15, 16, and 17. The youth are studying this together. Which one of you guys have those chapters? Do any, are any of you guys here that has those chapters, 14, 15, 16? Which one do you have, Landon? 14. You're studying 14? Okay, so you, you had to study about King Jeroboam, right? And uh, the splitting of the kingdom there. So I've been looking at all these chapters, and it's interesting. They pretty much repeat over and over and over. It's like almost the exact same story. And so I'm going to show you a quick synopsis of the different kings and how similar... Uh, the Bible describes their reign. King Jeroboam, first king of the ten northern tribes of Israel. It talks about him like this, describing his reign. But you have done evil above all who were before you, and you've gone and made for yourself other gods and metal images, provoking me to anger, and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam, and I will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel, and I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. This is a description of what God thought about the king Jeroboam. But uh, he doesn't say much better things about the next one, Nadab. Uh, this is what it says about Nadab. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the way of his father and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin. But it doesn't say much different about the next one, Basha. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against ba Baasha and his house, both because of all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands and in being like the house of Jeroboam, and also because he destroyed it. 
And it really doesn't have much better to say about Elah, the next guy to reign. Thus Zimri destroyed all the house of Baasha, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Baasha by Jehu the prophet, for all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, which they sinned and which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. And then the next guy, Zimri, it doesn't really have much better to say about Zimri. Because of his sins that he committed, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, for his sin which he committed, making Israel to sin. And it doesn't have much better to say about Omri. For Omri, it says, Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. And finally, it goes on, for he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and his sins that he had made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger by their idols. And finally, we get to Ahab, and he doesn't have much good to say about Ahab. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it goes on to say, And as if it had not been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him and erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Need I remind us that these are kings of God's nation? Kings of God's nation. One after another after another, that all that he could say about them was he did worse than the guys that were before him, and he did worse than the guys that were before him, and he did worse than the guys that were before him, and it's this continual, like, they're walking down a path of worse and worse wickedness. God's people. These are, quote, God's people, his nation. He marries Jezebel, a priestess, uh, a princess of, uh, of the priest of Baal. <laughs> so much so that he, instead of building God the sanctuary or fixing God's broken down sanctuary, he builds a temple for Baal to worship, everybody to worship in. It didn't take a moment for this to happen. Here's a quote from the book uh, Prophets and Kings describing this very situation. It says, apostasy... Prevailing in Ahab's day was the result of many years of evil doing. Step by step, year after year, Israel had been departing from the right way. For generation after generation, they had refused to make straight paths for their feet. And at last, the great majority of people had yielded themselves to the leadership of the powers of darkness. Year after year. Decade after decade, even century after century, wickedness had been the leadership of Israel. That was God's church of the Old Testament. God's people, quote unquote. Makes you wonder like, and they still considered themselves God's people. If you would have asked them, they would have said, well, yeah, we're God's people. Yet we worship Baal. I want to contemplate our time a little bit. Jesus says, For as the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as were the days of Noah, so will the, Son, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. It, the Bible says very clearly that just like it was in the days of Noah, that's what it's like at the end of time. If we believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon, then we have to admit that we live in a time of apostasy. <laughs> A time where sinfulness is brought into the body of Christ and recognized as normal. But you know, God's judgments lingered. His grace lingered long, long time. But his judgment did come on Israel of old. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Uh, for us, that doesn't even seem that bad because we get so much rain, we wouldn't think too much of it until you realize that irrigation was not a thing in those days. They didn't have water pumped to their house through pipes. They couldn't turn a faucet on. 
If it, there was no rain or dew, that literally meant starvation. It's interesting. God's judgment comes upon the people in this profound manner. Not, not just no rain, but no dew. Can you imagine? Nothing to give the desperate thirst that the plants had a little bit of something to survive. As you can imagine, everything turned brown and dead. This was an agricultural nation. They survived on the rain. If, if there was no water to water the animals, if there was no rain to water the, the gardens, that's it. Like, they're in serious, serious, dire circumstances. This means peop- children are starving to death in Israel. And yet it's interesting. I find this very interesting. Jezebel says, the reason there's no rain is because of Elijah. Like, what? After all this apostasy, after all of this, it's very clear. Elijah comes in front of everybody and says, because of your sins, it's not going to rain. And then Jezebel says, no, it's not because of our sins. It's because of Elijah. Elijah's the sinner. If we kill him, if we could just kill Elijah, it'll rain again. Baal has to be appeased. And if Baal's appeased by the death of Elijah, it will rain again. That's, that's what Jezebel convinced Ahab of. And so they'd make desperate search for, for Elijah everywhere. They, they search all of the surrounding nations. They search every home trying to find this renegade that has, quote, caused the earth to not ra- have its rain. Gives you a little inkling of what it will be like in the last days. When they say, it's these people who have got, brought God's displeasure. If we kill them, God will bless us again. And yet, of course, God has protected Elijah, hidden him out of plain sight. Three years of deprivation, privation, starvation, and some very ugly moments pass. Yes, for the Extremely wealthy, they make it. But for those who are not, it's ugly times. And finally, God commands Elisha, show your face. Go show up to Ahab. And it's interesting, when Elijah says, says, I'm here, tell Ahab to come and talk to me. The very first words that Ahab says to him is when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered him, that's Elijah saying back, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Elijah talks to the king as if he's nobody. Without... You guys don't get it because we don't live in a monarchy like this. But th- that was simply be off with his head moment. There's no, and, and traditionally in those times, you, nobody will speak to a king that way. You will die immediately. But the king shudders in his boots knowing that it is the God of Israel that brought this curse. And dare he say something wrong to Elijah. They may not end this circumstance. Elijah does not palliate King Ahab with the words, don't worry, it's going to rain soon. He says, you are the one that has caused this. You helped lead these people into this circumstance. In a very real way, I want us to realize this. In a very real way, our actions, our deeds and misdeeds affect the entire body. Elijah called Ahab the troubler of Israel, not the troubler of his own life, not the troubler of his personal relationship to Jesus. He called him the troubler of Israel. And thus he was. For he turned a blind eye to sin and even welcomed it. And so it is for us today. Each and every one of us can be a troubler of God's people today. If we palliate sin turn a blind eye to it and say nothing. 
to our brother or sister who has lost their way. Contemplating today, we live in a time of desperate evil. Elijah's day is little compared to the day that we live in. God compared our day not to Elijah. He compared our day to Sodom and Gomorrah and to, and to the days of Noah. When there was not even 7,000. <laughs> That's what God says the end of the times looks like. We have to absolutely guard against the, the body being polluted yes. by a fear to harm personal feelings because of sin entering the body. Yes. We must have an Elijah message Amen. in our day, which communicates that we will stand for truth. Amen. We will stand for truth. Yes. Regardless of whether it's legal, yes. regardless of whether it's popular, yes. regardless of whether it's emotional or offensive, yes. truth is truth. I want to share a quote from you. This is from the book uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, specifically referring to this Elijah message. Today, notice the word, today, there is need of the voice of stern rebuke. For grievous sins have separated the people from God. Infidelity is fast becoming fashionable. Smooth sermons are so often preached... The smooth servants so often preach make no lasting impression. The trumpet does not have a certain sound. Men are not cut to the heart by the plain, sharp truths of God's word. Amen. Uh, Hallelujah. Glory to God. There was a, a custom of natives in um, New Guinea I was told about. And um, the way the custom worked in their pagan times was they would have these rituals where they'd have songs and dances, and they'd work themselves up in kind of this frenzy. And, and, and then they would call, they called these murder songs. And, and, and as they were working themselves up in this frenzy, they would, they would name the names of the people who wish, they wished to kill, and then they would go do it. It's a pretty wicked and horrible um, ceremony. Uh, when these people, this group of people were converted... <laughs> Um, the people who brought the word of God to them was trying to Christianize some of their misunderstandings. And it's interesting what they did. They kept the ritual, but they changed the object. <laughs> they still had a ritual in which they sang. They still had a ritual in which they shouted. But instead of murder songs, they sang, they yelled out sins. <laughs> which they believed was destroying the people and which they believed needed to be removed. It was this, this, this experience of them calling out sin in the body and which they would be adamantly willing to remove at all cost. What an interesting ritual. I'm not sure that uh, I would popularize such a thing today, but I find it interesting that even... Even a people that had been so confused and polluted by paganism were able to call out <laughs> brokenness and sin amongst themselves. And so today I think we find ourselves in this circumstance where we have to address apostasy. We have to. There has to be a calling out of sin. There must be an encouraging of the process of repentance. But I believe that it is often misunderstood. So I'm going to take a couple of steps backwards. <laughs> Go back to the beginning. Some, some feel that statements like that would promote legalism, Phariseeism, and judging, which the Bible adamantly condemns. So let me cover some groundwork before we come back to addressing apostasy. We have to address some basic basic ideas, behavior, and salvation. There has to always be a healthy balance between these two important truths. The first truth, which, there, which, which is absolutely must be taught, is that we cannot earn salvation by good works. That must be taught. It must be adamantly 
presented and preached. The Bible is so clear. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God and not a result of works, so that anyone may boast. The Bible is clear. It is grace that allows us into God's heavenly courts, not anything which we can do of our own works. The Bible says that our best works are filthy rags, that the best that we can offer God is, is garbage. There's, there's nobody here that can stand in front of anybody else and say, I've made it, I've arrived, if you could just be like me. So we must start with that foundation that works never, never give us right to the kingdom of heaven. Yet that must also be balanced with the second truth. We can lose our salvation through wicked choices. The word of God is clear in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Additionally, in Matthew 25, verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Salvation is repeatedly connected to righteous actions, not because we earned it, not because our righteous actions bring us salvation, but because by God's grace, we are being transformed, righteous actions are the result. Justification and sanctification hand in hand working. So we have to address this fear of legalism and Phariseeism. We have to address questions like rules versus relationship. There's a great danger in Phariseeism. Uh, That was the issue that Jesus had to fight with in his day. (laughs) And we see it story after story, right? What was really the error of the Pharisees, though? If you think about it, they were working hard to, quote, keep the commandments. They were, quote, doing the right thing and and teaching the right thing. The, The problem is they had made rules upon rules upon rules to the point that they had lost the relationship. They didn't know why they did what they did anymore, to the point that they really lost the actual foundation of righteousness. They lost the relationship. When we talk about addressing apostasy, we are not undermining the fact that all motivation for righteousness is love. All motivation for righteousness is and must be love. It cannot be founded on anything else. It cannot be founded upon fear or or compulsion, or the desire for other people to see us doing what's right so we feel better about ourselves, all of that is bankrupt. It's built on relationship because I love Christ, I've seen his love for me, I choose and I want something better. And because he, he can lead me into paths of righteousness. All of this is true. All of this is true. That's the foundation, the basis of why we choose righteous actions. Yet that's... Yet love does not give us permission to turn a blind eye to actions which destroy the body. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe, mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. What was the problem with the Pharisees? The problem was a checklist religion where they, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. And it became no relationship with God whatsoever. Uh, A lot of what they were doing were right actions, but because they had no relationship, the actual foundation of truth was broken in their relationship with God. That's a dangerous religion, and we need to guard against it adamantly. Jesus rebuked Phariseeism, but I have to mention something very plainly. This is not what we are predicted as the greatest danger in the last days. See, there there are two ditches, and we want to guard against the two ditches. We want to guard against Phariseeism. But Jesus said, in the last days, the great danger is not Phariseeism. This is what God predicts will be like in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 1, or sorry, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, 
unappeasable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen in conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. The Bible says that this is a description of Christians. It says that they have an appearance of godliness. Worldly people do not seek an appearance of godliness. They don't care. This is a description of Christians in the last days. And the Bible says, what is the description of of Christians in the last days? That they have an appearance of godliness, but they are genuinely wicked. You see, the problem of the last days is not Phariseeism. The problem of the last days is licentiousness. In fact, if you read just the very next chapter, Timothy again, uh, Paul in his letter to Timothy once again goes in further detail. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wandering off into myths. What is the problem of the last days? The same problem Elijah dealt with. It's the same problem Elijah dealt with. Wickedness in the body and then calling themselves followers of God. Not Phariseeism. Open wickedness that goes un, unadmonished. <laughs> Standards are so important because it, it brings safety to the body. In fact, standards are so important for the world because, in fact, brothers and sisters, it breaks my heart because here I have new believers coming up and and making a public proclamation of their faith, making a promise in front of the whole congregation. And and then the next week, I see a brother or sister in the faith who, who openly, openly condemns the things they just vowed to. That breaks my heart. Because I like I've been nurturing people, new believers, and they come into the church and their faith is destroyed by long-term Adventists. Saying, oh no, those things don't matter. <laughs> Who cares about un- clean and unclean foods? That's baloney. Who cares about who cares about jewelry? Who cares the fact that our church has an official stance on the position of jewelry? Who cares about going out to eat on Sabbath? That doesn't matter. I choose whatever I want. Who cares about modesty in the, in the body? And, and one after another, breaking down the foundations of our faith. But Pete, leaders. Do we think... How long... Do you think God will have grace on the body before he finally comes with judgment? It can go on forever. My pet peeve. Is this really a salvation issue? That's that's my pet peeve, that sentence. (laughs) Is this really a salvation issue? What is the question really asking? What are you saying when you ask the question, is that really a salvation issue? What you're saying is, um, can we lower the standards? What's the least amount I can do and get into into heaven? Or or that's a, quote, small sin. Let Let me show you a quote on the topic of small sins. This is a very balanced quote, okay? It comes from the beautiful book, Steps to Christ. If you've not read this book, it is so beautiful. It talks about how to have a real relationship with Christ. It's a really good book. Please read it. It says, God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in his estimation as well as that of man. We don't, in law, we don't condemn all sins the same. Some receive death penalties. Some receive a slap on the wrist, you know? Same with God. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem in the eyes of men, no sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is partial, imperfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. What this is saying is, 
anything that God says in his word is a salvation issue. Like, if he says, that's what I want you to do, then it is salvational. Why? Because he asked us to do it. That's his will. And if we say, well, no, I just don't feel like doing that, or it's not common or popular today, I don't care. It's God's will. He has pronounced it to us. There's no such thing as a small sin. In fact, just look at some biblical examples. <laughs> Adam and Eve, thrown out of heaven for what? Eating fruit they were told not to eat. Cain, condemned because he brought to worship something that was not instructed to bring to worship. Uzzah, slain in the moment for touching the ark. We know that there's other issues in the hearts. And, and, and to us, we say, oh, that's a small thing. But God sees the heart. He knows what's going in the heart of Cain. He knows that he was going to go kill his brother. It wasn't even about a vegetable versus a lamb only. It was the, the brokenness of the heart that led him to the, quote, small sin. And for each of those, it was a salvation issue. We should never ask, will this small thing keep me out of heaven? You know, whenever I was in school, <clears throat> I learned algebra at a young age, and I learned the algebraic equation of what I had to get on the final in order to accomplish what grade I wanted in the class. <clears throat> and, and it was pretty easy. You know, you, you calculate how the final is weighted compared to everything else. You calculate what percentage you have in it, in the, in the grade, and you calculate what grade you need to get on the final in order to get the final grade. And then you know how hard to study. If you only need a C to get a, an A on the final or, or an A in the class, then you don't have to study that hard, right? And so that's the way I did school. Like, I, I just need a B. Like, all I need is a B, okay? How, what is the least amount of effort I can put in to get a B? That's how I did school. For Christianity, that's a broken way of thinking. Very broken. You would never go to your spouse and say that. What's the least amount of love I can give to you and make you still happy? You would never do that. You wouldn't dare say that to your spouse because that's not even love at all. And if, if we say that to God, he ought to question our motives. True Christianity is motivated by a love that is sacrificial, that says, God, not how little but how much. How much can I give to you? Amen. How much can I surrender? What else can I give of my heart for you? Yes. You all don't get to see it, but I get to have a hard conversations with young believers. Paying tithe for the first time. That's a hard thing. You know, giving up other issues in life. Those are hard things. I have to have those conversations. Please, please, for the love of Christ, don't, don't make me go through that hard conversation with a new believer and then have them come to church and hear you say exactly opposite of what we believe. Jesus has something so much better. We think of things in terms of sacrifice. Oh, I have to give up this. I have to give up that for God. There's a picture of a white flag on the screen for a reason because the whole, the whole theme is the concept of surrender. Christianity is about surrender. What can I give up for my relationship to God? Anything that stands between me and Christ. That simple. The Christian journey is a journey of not just sacrifice, not just surrender, but when we realize that what we have to give up <laughs> For, versus what God actually gives us in return is a crazy good deal. God does not require us to give up anything that it is for our best interest to retain. And all that he does, he has the well-being of his children in view. If God has brought something to your attention and you say... I just don't see it. It seems pointless. I don't get the idea. Just say, God, if that's your will, 
I'm not seeing it yet, but if that's your will, I want it. I want it in my life. I want your will in my life. Whatever, whatever it is. It's hard, it's easy, whatever it is. That's what the vows are. These people made public vows. God, I won't let anything stand between me and following you all the way. Support them, love them, and live it with them. Live it with them. Amen? Amen. With that, let's sing our closing song. Please stand. I will follow thee.
God has given a profound standard to his church. Standards are high. Amen. Not because we're worthy or capable, but because we serve an awesome God. Amen. He is holy. He is holy. And he, he says that if you're my people, I want you to be holy too. Yes. Amen. We're all broken. <laughs> we're all erring. We're all trying to find our way. But let's honestly seek God together and to pursue that high standard for which he's given us. Let us pray. Lord, you are righteous. Even the angels in heaven say, holy, holy, holy. The, the, the angels, which are righteous, veil their face before you. Wow. We stand just uh, looking at you just kind of in our wretchedness, uh, realizing, wow, I'm, I'm, no, I'm in no way able to to come before a holy God. But yet your, your sacrifice allowed us to, and you told us, come boldly. <laughs> and so, Lord God, I come boldly, just in my brokenness, though, saying, Lord, please, <laughs> take my filthy rags and give me your coat of righteousness, because otherwise I've got no hope. May we pursue that together. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. 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 Amen.